just turned 24 and I had this pretty life-changing experience. So I, I had been raised a, a fairly conservative Christian growing up, going to church, doing this, this thing on Sundays, but it never really um, rippled out from that. The passion was sort of left in the pew and it never, never went outside of the walls. And it was, in fact, I would say, the opposite of what Jesus taught. And so it was just a bunch of pious acts of religiosity, right? I would call Jesus Lord as a title to which I gave reverence instead of as it is etymologically intended, a position to which I gave my obedience, right? To really truly submit to him being this like God of the universe and like who like put on flesh and then like became like nothing and then I was offering him church attendance. I mean, that's kind of ridiculous. I need to see the sort of poverty that Jesus invited his followers to alleviate I hadn't really, right? Like my whole life was hemmed into comfort and convenience from like the womb and uh, I never needed anything. So I call a friend of mine and I'm like, hey, I know you're going to Nicaragua. You know, uh, do you have any trips coming up? And I wanna see what it's like. I wanna know what poverty really looks like. And so he said, sure, actually, I'm like leaving in a couple of weeks. How fast can you get a passport? So we went to a place called La Chereca. It's where the poorest of the poor lived and survived on the waste. It was uh, in a landfill uh, where there were kids playing hopscotch on used syringes. There were livestock grazing on waste. People live here in this dump. They survive on this waste. And so they're so desperate, in fact, that many many um, families will, will prostitute their little girls to the garbage men in exchange for first pick of this trash. And I mean, what a... Um, depraved image, right? People chasing garbage trucks and then trading human beings for survival, for trash. I mean, that's about as dark as it gets. So I'm getting off this plane from Nicaragua, I'm back in the States and I'm like confronted with this very juxtaposed reality like of wealth, like a real clear picture of wealth having just come from a real clear picture of poverty and desperation, thinking, man, how do I, how do I enter into poverty in a way that's meaningful for others? This, there's this picture of this God of all things who flung into space stars out of his fingertips, right? I mean, like, there's this, this guy putting, wrapping himself in skin and becoming not just one of us, but dirtying himself up, revealing himself to shepherds, the not good enoughs, right? Being born in a feeding trough, becoming a refugee baby. That God came in the form of his son, but how he came in the form of his son. I'm like, man, if God can enter into the dirt, this guy who's so closely related to the dirt shouldn't find it too difficult to kneel in it. And I was like, man, I'm gonna quit my job. I'm gonna sell everything I owned. I had a lot of debt that I had, you know, incurred and uh, I had to eat rice and beans for like eight months and then I quit my job and I remember telling my boss at JP Morgan Chase like uh, that I was leaving it was it was it was weird because it was like attached to a really meaningful reason too and so I was just like fingers crossed don't ask me why I'm doing it because you're not gonna believe it he thought I had a better deal somewhere else and a better offer and, and I told him in a way he was right only instead of climbing the corporate ladder, I decided to follow the God who descended his. I officially became homeless in uh, January of 2010. And it was a real jarring experience that did not come easily. It wasn't as romantic as it sounds. It was deeply painful, deeply depressing, 
I had tied my identity to what I owned and all of a sudden I didn't own anything. All right, so I'm hanging out one day, homeless, at a lake. I meet this guy who's also homeless. He was telling me that he needed a pair of steel toe work boots. I didn't really know why. I didn't question it. We go over to Walmart. I'm like, I think I can cover the work boots. Let's, let's do that. We start talking and he's like, well, for, for liability reasons, I have to have steel toe work boots to go onto a construction site, but I've got a gig lined up just need these boots and so I thought okay that's that's an easy you know bug we could we could just squash that real quick so he gets these boots he gets this job and then he gets off the streets granted of course that's a very easy case helping people overcome the obstacles of homelessness it's it's really complex and I was like man maybe I need to find a way while I'm out here on the streets to like help other people with shoes socks clothes underwear you know, whatever they need. I started a ministry where we would, uh, the first iteration of it was, it was actually called Clothe Your Neighbor As Yourself. It's a nonprofit clothing brand. We'd sell clothing online. My poor mom and dad would ship uh, those items from their house um, as they were purchased online and then would send me the money, put on a visa or whatever, a little debit card, so that I could take people shopping for the clothes that they needed. So it was all born out of relationship with the people in need. Over time, that changed. You know, after about a year, I realized much of my charity is really sort of perpetuating poverty in people's lives, sustaining suffering. And I'm not about that. I want to help people overcome the pain. I was speaking in Atlanta at an event once, and this guy comes up to me afterwards and he's like, I know you do a lot of like clothing people on the streets. Have you ever thought about providing uniforms for vulnerable children and orphans in developing countries? It's like, no, why would, I, why would I do that? You know, think about uniforms. And he said, well, it's different than it is here in the States. In the States, it's a private school that would wear uniforms. In developing nations, pretty much every public school has uniforms because the disparity between the rich and the poor is so vast. There's no middle class in, in many of these places and you'll have one kid come in with the, the, you know, the sweetest Jordans and then another kid not only not having shoes, but pants, underwear, shirt either. So to sort of create uniformity and not distract in the middle of class, uniforms are a requirement of the government. So he started taking me out to Kenya. visit villages and most of the rural areas that were hard to reach. And I realized, man, this is so affordable. It gives a child, if you can cover the cost of a uniform, and it gives them access to education, thus ending the perpetual cycle of generational poverty. I started doing that, and, and we changed our name over time to Neighborly, not just um, doing this Clothe Your Neighbor initiative, but other initiatives like Welcome Your Neighbor or Feed Your Neighbor and others. For us, Clothe Your Neighbor is now make uniforms locally, hiring the women from that community to weave those uniforms, providing them with the weaving machines uh, to do that, to have jobs, to buy the, the uniforms then from them at a, at a discounted rate because we've provided the, the machines. And then um, we only buy through them so that then they can grow their business, then become autonomous until we then go on to another community and do that same thing again. Um, and by doing that that way, we've been able to bring electricity to certain communities for the first time in history. Clean water being piped in from the mountain eventually, uh, you know, uh, they did that on their own. We didn't even do that. Like that was, they as a community took ownership over that. So we've been able to witness so many beautiful things, um, all because of a pair of boots, you know, and a guy who just needed, you know, it's just needed a pair of boots, man. I mean, we all can look at people and say, hey, you know, pull yourself up by the bootstraps. What if they don't have boots? 
<laughs> you know? And what if we keep untying their laces and making it more complex for them? And, you know, charging more for a pair of boots for people who need it the most. And just, I mean, there's all sort of sick ways that uh, the system is not set up uh, for people to win, but to exploit people to, to the system's advantage. And so we've, we've had to sort of fight that too, and there's been a lot of obstacles in the way. Are those new Casper, kicks? You know, yeah, my friend I killed my kill twice. Today's Monday. Today's Tuesday. Yeah, it's just it's just <laughs> Tuesday. Last day to tell you Barely. Right. Good morning. Go ahead, and grab a seat. No one's making me nervous. Today. Hey, we could have called. The rocks are cold. So, uh, raise your hand if this is your first time here. Oh yeah, this is gonna be great. Okay, so I'm so excited. Why did you choose to do this this morning? I remember when I was homeless in one city, they, there were some, some college students that oh, were yeah. staying up all night long, uh, making bread from scratch. They were hand churning honey butter, uh, making bread, honey butter. They had uh, a flower garden. They were picking flowers from the garden, putting them in vases. They had chickens and they were raising these chickens and boiling those eggs and bringing them to labor pools where a lot of my homeless friends were finding work for the day. And I thought, man, like that's, that's so important because, so what happens is like people who are working their way off the streets by going to these labor pools, they miss out on feeding programs that don't get served li until later in the day. And so the system isn't really built to um, sort of empower people who are trying. Hey guys, you can stay right where you are. We don't want to disrupt the line, but we're going to kind of circle up-ish and pray. But before we do, Ansley's going to read a scripture to us. And so I was like, man, these crazy college students, they're staying up all night, just like filled with the, the, the Holy Spirit, just the joy and the energy that comes from that. And then they would go to these labor pools and they'd set out a candle and just serve this like super dignifying meal that wasn't marked by like, you know, uh, it wasn't just like this massive feeding program where lots of people were going through it and you didn't know people, but it was like this intimacy that was traded for efficiency. It wasn't a model built on efficiency, but on intimacy. And, and so I remembered, I told Kristen, I was like, I want to do something like that. We call ourselves the Breakfast Brigade. And so we do the same thing. We have chickens, we pick flowers, we hand churn honey butter because it's not really what we do, but the love that we can jam into it, anything that we do. <laughs> All right, on the count of three, Breakfast Brigade. One, two, three, Breakfast Brigade. Right on. And no one All right, everyone hey, that you know. did it, have a Welcome Your Neighbor Initiative is really just a text-based alert system that we call the Welcome Party. And it's people who are sort of on call anytime uh, there is a refugee that's in need. So it might be like a refugee who's fled war and persecution uh, from the airport and just being that first place they see greeting them with signs in their native language, um, welcoming them to Tallahassee and just making sure they know, man, there's a family here that's like ready to receive you and to have you over for dinner, to raise our kids alongside of your kids, to learn about each other, to grow alongside of each other. So I remember uh, one day I got called by the refugee resettlement agency to greet a family that was coming from Afghanistan. We went to the airport, we had our signs, we had their names on the signs and just like you could tell that they were carrying more than luggage. I remember dropping them off in the hotel room with their two kids, Ahmad's sister and his wife, and thinking this is a 
very small hotel room for this family. So I go back the next day, I pick him up, bring his whole family back to our house, and we share a meal together. As, as Muslims, they, they pray during the day, and so they were at times in the, in the carport at our house and, you know, borrowing rugs, and, and they, you know, know that I was praying to Jesus, you know, and just like we were, it was just this, this beautiful melting pot in our own, at our dining table, and the starting line for us is the dinner table, but that's also the finish line. Then I came down to um, to speak in Florida at an event, and uh, while I was in Florida, I met my wife at a coffee shop, and we actually ended up staying up until like 2 a.m. just talking to each other on a park bench, and she was so intriguing to me. I was like, <laughs> I don't want to be homeless anymore. I, I want to I want to chase this girl, <laughs> and so. Um, I go back up to Atlanta, tie up some loose ends, and uh, I move uh, to the city where Kristen was living in Tallahassee. And so we, at that point, start talking marriage. We start rethinking what is neighborly and, and what would it mean to be neighborly as a husband and wife and then one day with kids. And would I be generous with my space? Would I welcome homeless folks into my home? Would I, how would I live, right? When when you actually have to be disciplined. Being um, an organization that exists to deinstitutionalize charity by helping folks become, uh, get in relationship with people at a disadvantage, to alleviate poverty um, in terms of friendship, um, because that's what was so beautiful for me when I was on the streets. So having a family and, you know, I've got a wife, I've got two kids, they have really forced us to rethink, well, what, what does it mean to, to, to use our lives to, to pour the love of God out on others? Like being that neighborly is so all about relationships and it's like, man, if uh, I'm here today, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter unless the people we serve matter to us tomorrow. Well, all the refugees have been in our house at some point and, and so like, our, our home is an open door to them, and they know that. But we also run a lot of things out of this house. We, um, because we, we don't think that we're like the owners. I think home ownership is kind of an illusion, actually. Like, if God is really, truly the owner of all that we have, then we're doing nothing more than house sitting, right? What does it mean to use his house in a way that he would use his stuff? If you give any of your stuff out on loan to somebody, you hope that they use it in a way that would honor uh, both its design and the intention of the person who owns it, or in God's case, designed it, right? And so we see our house as sort of this incubator within which people can sort of reclaim their lives. And so we have teams showing up here at our house um, to serve breakfast at the labor pools uh, to ensure that guys experiencing homelessness don't go to work on an empty stomach. And so we use this house as sort of the, a launching pad to send people out, splitting up into teams and then descending upon our city because we think, man, God is so good. We just want people to know how great His love is and how extraordinary that love is. So our house really, this thing we're calling the neighborly house, we want to do other iterations of that, right? Like set people up to, you know, equip them to do it too, right? I mean, we have people coming in all the time that my son at this point, Atlas is his name, Atlas, and he, uh, he'll he be inviting people and like homeless on the side of the street, like to come over for dinner. Like even the last night, like we didn't have any plans. He was like, is anybody coming over? And I was like, no, not tonight, just our family, isn't that awesome? He's like, no, I want someone to come over, you know? Man, it's just so beautiful.